We want to thank Marjolene Thomas, Edward Green, Everett Tate, and David Stick for joining us today. Our moderator will be Horace Whitfield, Executive Director of the Elizabethan Gardens. God help him. <laughs> <laughs> He, he was like, you know, after the lunch today, he was like, are there any guidelines? I was like, I'm sure you can just have one or two questions. The rest of the evening will be taken <laughs> care of. So uh, we thank Horace for doing that. We also want to thank Channel 20, who's filming tonight, so that we can have these memories forever um, in our archives. So thank you very much for that as well. We'd also like to thank Festival Park, Scott Stroh, uh, for making the accommodations and being a partner in tonight's event as well. So... No more of me. Let's move on with what we're really here for, and that is Memories of the Outer Banks. Horace? Thank you, Carl. You know, I'm, I feel like I've been called to the council ring tonight. <laughs> um, but I would like to just play on that metaphor and invite you to join us. Um, it's really, uh, this is really an event uh, because uh, today we not only have celebrated the Outer Banks in, the, in those beginnings, but we've also recognized uh, David for the legacy that he, he is leading us. <clears throat> and David, David, we appreciate your humility because we know that we would all feel the same way that you do if we were chosen. So. We do understand that um, it is a great honor, and uh, we appreciate your being here to uh, share that honor with us tonight. I want to um, just kind of, um, when I was asked, when Carl asked me to moderate this session, I thought pretty quickly, well, you know, that doesn't seem to be uh, too difficult a task because I know all these folks. Um, I met Edward soon after I moved here in the early 70s with a knapsack and a box of books. And um, then shortly um, after I uh, taught school and was building a boat and sailing off of Pond Island, I got to know Su Susie and Everett and spent some time with them. That was when soft shells that they were shedding were going for $3.50 a dozen. <laughs> And fortunate enough to spend a great deal of time with David during the 80s, during America's 400th anniversary, when I remember his saying things like, you know, I don't think we should have built, we, I was against building a ship in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> and when somebody on the committee suggested that perhaps we should sail the Elizabeth II across to England or back. <laughs> David simply said, well, everyone who thinks that is a good idea ought to sign on the crew. <laughs> and after a pregnant pause, nothing else was said. Marjolene, I haven't gotten, gotten to know you as well, um, as early as I have some of the others, but for many years I've heard your name spoken with reverence. People smile when they say your name. And I've heard your, I heard your name a long time before I ever saw your face or realized that that was the face that I was looking at. And um, we've spent some time recently taking some trips to New York and um, singing together, doing some other things. So, you know, all, all of you uh, I know from um, my past lives. And I also know from what this community has uh, given to me and all of all of that that I appreciate I tell folks that I came here to the Outer Banks to grow up they asked me if I was born and raised here and I said no I wasn't but I grew up here and this is the first place I landed where I was allowed to grow the way that I've been able to grow here and the thing that struck me though when I first began to think about what we would do this evening was the fact that Thirty years ago, all of you were about the same age I am. <laughs> Did you have to say that? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, you know, I've got, still got a heck of a lot to do. Or 
you know, this is, this is really the measure of what people can do when they have an opportunity. And uh, I want to welcome all of you here tonight. And, uh, and again, to get back to what we're here to do, with this being the council fire, you know, it's really the light of the word that we're here to seek. And I learned from my father, who was a journalist, and who I always thought ought to write jokes or novels or something else, that to tell the truth creatively is a lot more difficult than it is to tell a lie. That's interesting. And that's where I would like for us to be tonight. I'd like for us to hear some true stories from what you recall that are going to shed some light on that part of our beginnings or your beginnings or the beginnings that you t see today that make this such a rich and wealthy place to live. David, I'm going to start with you. That's great. <laughs> Boy, this is my day. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not I think I might tell you, as I will, there are people here. There are still people out there who can't see them, but are there people out there? Yeah, okay. Um, this is the day I'll never forget. Because after these festivities over at Wright Brothers, um, I was standing out there surrounded by people, uh, mainly women. And uh, all of a sudden, my trousers fell to the floor. <laughs> Notice I have a belt on tonight. <laughs> I didn't today. <laughs> and so I'll never forget this day. <laughs> and it has nothing to do with what we're doing tonight. Or that honor today is those damn trousers falling. To the floor. <laughs> so. Um, well, that just goes to show question? you what you remember. <laughs> what's your question? I'd like, David, for you to. Um, Tell us about um, your boyhood in Skyco. Right. I know I know that you came here as a young man in Nickers, and um, you made friends there, and that's really where I have heard you say that you some in Nickers, some in skirts. <laughs> <laughs> well, we won't go there. But um, I'd like for you to just share with us some of those days and uh, some of those people that you remember who influenced you and what you um, cre have created as your vision of the Outer Banks. I, I better begin the, in, in the beginning and confess that I was born in New Jersey. I don't usually admit that, so please don't tell anybody. Uh, my dad came down here in the 20s hunting and fishing, fell in love with the place and started getting options for land. He could see that potentially there was something big going to happen here sometime. He'd go back to New Jersey, he'd get partners to invest, and they'd come back and buy the land. And in the summer of 1928, uh, he, uh, he and, a, and a partner developed Virginia Dare Shores. Any of you ever heard of that? On the, on the east side of Kittyhawk Bay, in what is now the town of Kill Devil Hills. They put a big, a big uh, dock going out into Kitty Hawk Bay, and they had two large buildings. One was just a pavilion. The other one had their uh, offices and their dining room and, and kitchen. And we spent that, that summer down here, 1928. I was eight years old. Came back again on, on uh, December, uh, for the 25th anniversary of the first flight. And uh, everybody assembled at Virginia Dare Shores and then got in whatever vehicles they could and were driven down to Kill Devil Hills for the ceremonies there. And at eight years old, I was uh, got a, a ride in the back of a pickup truck. And a lovely lady uh, held me in there so I wouldn't fall out of the truck. Her name was Amelia Earhart, mm. which is my only real claim for fame. So I, <laughs> I had to tell you that. Uh, the next year, uh, when uh, my dad was a nationally known illustrator, he just quit painting. He swore he'd never again paint for pay. And uh, so we moved down to Skyco, rented Skyco Lodge from uh, Jewel Day, who had built it over there. Any of you ever remember? No, you wouldn't remember Skyco Lodge. I'll tell you the story on that, though. 
I better not. I'm, I've talked too long here already. Oh, go ahead and tell me. Uh, Mr. Day was, uh, I think, the Attorney General of the state of Kentucky and a man of, of considerable means. And he came down and he bought a piece of property that consisted about half the, the land between what is now the Roanoke Sound Bridge Causeway and Oregon Inlet. The south half was owned by the Body Island Club and the upper half, his, he called the Goosewing Club. Now, there was a problem, and that is that uh, sometimes men going to hunting lodges did things other than hunt. And Mrs. Day didn't like this idea that these men were coming down here, and she insisted that she and uh, the other ladies should come with them. The men said no, so Jewel Day bought the old Ashby place over at Skyco on Croatan Sound, remodeled it, put in electricity, a Delco plant out back, had a couple of monkeys in a cage, had peacocks running all over the place, uh, 14 horses, a big field there. And uh, the recession, the depression hit, and Dad leased it from him. So we spent 40, four years there from 1929 to 1933, uh, probably the most wonderful day, years of my life. And it was so different from, from New Jersey. Uh, I'd already had a taste of the Outer Banks when we were, that summer we were over in the beach, when you had to, uh, if you drove a vehicle, you had to deflate the tires and drive in somebody else's track or you get stuck. And uh, so, that part of it I'd become, become sort of accustomed to. But when I was enrolled uh, a month late in Manio Elementary School, uh, I, I felt that immediately I was accepted. And I felt that way ever since. Uh, the people here were so, so nice, so cordial, so interested in having somebody from away from here come in and join the community. I had dear friends then, and some of them still around. Uh, incidentally, I had a, a, a man come up to me today and, and introduced himself and said that I had saved his father's life. His father was Ben Creef, who was probably my best friend here in Manio. And after the 33 hurricane, I think it was, uh, we went out in a canoe to inspect things, as a couple of 13-year-old kids <laughs> would. And we're paddling along on top of the road, which was, of course, flooded. And the flood waters were coming back, back into Croatan Sound, so there was a lot of current. And we tipped that thing over. I don't remember saving Ben's life, but I know that we came pretty close. But uh, those were wonderful years. Um, the freedom of living there, of uh, being able to go into Manio to school and, and have such good friends and be accepted in this community. Uh, I, it's, it, it just started my life, and it was uh, something I'll never forget. Uh, I'll remember that even after I forget my trousers falling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, David, those of us who um, have uh, come here and been accepted understand that feeling. I remember um, when I was standing watching the Elizabeth II being built and leaning on the fence and explaining to folks what was going on, met a man from Plymouth who said, you know, he said, I came here as a young man. He said, it was just me and he said, I was just a redneck. Me and another boy sailed, sailed down the sound and here into the bay. And he said, we rolled up our pants legs and walked up to the marsh. And he said, before we even set our feet ashore, he said, the sheriff was standing there saying, Boys, I don't know where y'all come from, but y'all better get back in that boat and you better go back. And he said, that's what we did. And it was years before we came back to Manio. But um, we know that um, all of us have um, been welcomed here and have made a home here. Edward, you're another one who um, has come here and adopted this as a home. I almost feel like saying that I was born in uh, April of 1953, and we know that's a lie. <laughs> but 
that, that was the beginning of the life that I've had, and it's been an incredible experience. Uh, I was, uh, had already decided I wanted to become a professional dancer when I was in New York City. Uh, actually, I, that happened to me in California right after I got out of the Navy. And uh, I started my training there, and then I went to New York, and I was taking a professional class, and it's not uncommon for people to uh, sit around, come and visit the class as you figure they're friends or relatives of people who are taking the class. And a uh, young man walked up to me afterwards by the name of John Lehman. He was the choreographer here for the Lost Colony. And he said, uh, would you ask me, would you be interested in being in a show in North Carolina? And I said, well, tell me more. And he and his wife had gone up there to do some training that winter, and so they had, had rented an apartment. So he said, why don't you come over for dinner one evening, meet my wife, and I will tell you all about the Outer Banks. And he started, didn't even tell me much that much about the show to begin with, but he started by talking about the people. And then he told me more about the show and the history, and well, I decided I did want to come, and I'll tell you, I was in love with the Outer Banks and the people before I ever got here. It was, it was mind-boggling, because he did not exaggerate. He described the area to a T. And we arrived, we came down Memorial Day weekend. The show didn't open until later in June, much later than it does now. And uh, we arrived Memorial Day weekend at about 8 in the morning uh, on Saturday. We had driven all night. We reached the top of the beach, and there was nothing. I mean, there were a few motels, a uh, few cottages, and then the old aristocracy cottages. But I mean, we, we could turn the corner there up at the north end of the beach, and we decided, I had five other dancers with me, and I th we decided we'd been scammed because we were told that we were going to play to an audience of about 1,800 to 2,000 every night. <laughs> and I and, and we rode all the way down the beach, never passed a car, and m <laughs> most of the cottage, and there was only the beach road, there was no such thing as a bypass, and most of the cottages were all closed up, the ones that were there, there really were not a lot of things to be seen. And uh, uh, we pulled into Matteo, and there wasn't even a car on a street in Matteo. There were very few cars to be seen any place, and that was 1953. And the, the main, this main street uh, roads, four or five roads, had been paved, and we pulled into the Aunt Mary and Uncle Bob O'Neill's wigwam, and uh, that's what they called it. it. Was a it was a tourist home, and they let us stay there until the offices of the uh, colony opened up, and uh, we shed our shoes because I, we were told everybody went barefoot, and in those days they really did. I mean. I, and the only place that was air conditioned on the island that I recall was Fearing's Restaurant. And we walked in there and uh, Ada was sitting there, Ava Cutrell and Sybil, and we walked in. And of course, everybody who lived there, there was, I mean, the population was so much smaller, I think the whole county would only have been about 4,000. And we walked into the, the uh, Fearing's restaurant, and they greeted us, and they have had us figured out, Peg, you come for the pageant? Everybody called it the pageant in those days. And uh, we were, our feet were freezing, because that was the only place in Dare County, I think, that had air conditioning, and they had it like a refrigerator. <laughs> but we got used to that, and then we had our first hush puppies. Oh. We knew we had arrived in heaven. And I have never regretted ever coming here since. It's just, and I must say, the talk about the people. By the time that first summer was over, the people were exactly as it was described. They were cordial, they were friendly, proud of the show. And uh, it, it really, I think John uh, Lehman had us brainwashed because he said, you know, the, the area has been isolated for a long time. And he said that, uh, it's very important that if I'm responsible for anybody coming down to spend time on this island, that they be aware of the fact that they're guests in this community of these people. And he went on to extol their praises. And I, I took that to heart. And I think because I did, and I sort of knew to keep my place as far as not be a, a brassy show person or How something like that. How long did that last, did it? What'd you say? <laughs> <laughs> This is beginning to sound like the Mutt and Jeff show. 
<laughs> anyway, I have never regretted coming here, and it has opened up worlds of opportunity. And and uh, I don't think my I told I, at the I was the master of ceremonies today at the uh, luncheon in honor of David, and I t and I wasn't going to say anything, but I turned to him and I said, David, I don't think my life would have been as meaningful to me if I had never met you. And I say that from the bottom of my heart. So we joke a lot, but I have so much respect for him, I can't tell you. And he was an inspiration to me from the first time I met him. So uh, my interest in doing things in the community continues on, and it's all your fault. So, <laughs> so what, you're, what you're saying, Eddie, is that uh, you adopted that philosophy until you met David? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have, that's part of my growing. I don't know that I had a philosophy. Yeah, I understand. May yeah. I ask Eddie a question? Sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, when you came to, to Roanoke Island and to be in this pageant, the uh, story goes that I understand Lehman told you that there would be lots of midgets in the show. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Now, if you want this, uh, thank you. She, she, uh -huh. She's prompting mm -hmm. me because the, the, the story I'm I've been proudest. around these guys well, before. <laughs> They're going to upstage me anyway. <laughs> but but uh, I was set, sitting on Aunt, Aunt Grace Davis's porch. Now, Aunt Grace Davis played a gona. And one other thing she did, in those days, the singers were all from the, um, from Princeton, from uh, Westminster, Westminster Choir, Choir College. And uh, she had a, usually had about eight of them that would stay at the house, and then she had a community uh, dining room, and she, she charged them room and board, and she would fix breakfast and, I think, lunch. But anyway, we were sitting on the front porch, and the, some of the singers were just arriving that f original weekend. And I heard probably Nina Williams telling somebody else, you, well, you know, there's over 500 midgets on the island. <laughs> 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 and it was two weeks before I found out that was their name. I couldn't understand <laughs> what, where all these little people were. <laughs> <laughs> That's a true story. <laughs> what, one more comment, I'm going to stop, but they say ignorance is bliss, and I was so happy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Everett, you're one who, um, whose eyes open not far from here. Was your home duck? Yes. Well, yep, duck. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, tell us what uh, life was like there, because I know uh, growing up as a boy in Raleigh, well, hearing one, hearing one of my neighbors talk about ducks because his father had taken him there hunting. And I also remember meeting a Methodist minister who was in a retirement home who uh, had a charge there at Duck United Methodist Church. And he can remember having uh, gone out in the lifeboat at the inlet when the station was still active there. And at Hattress? No, up um, north of Duck. Up above Duck? Mm-hmm. Oh, man. Yep. I think you you're are. before my time. But <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it, yeah. it was. Yeah, I was born in Duck, 1924, mm -hmm. and uh, grew up there, of course. Went to school Kitty Hawk, and I uh, was school bus. But uh, there was a dirt road. Well, they built the bridge when I was started school at Kitty Hawk in the first grade. Because I remember riding the school bus across that place where they came from across the sound and was building a road through there, built a bridge. And I may be wrong, let's see, it was 1930, I believe, when they built that bridge. Am I right? I, 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 I think so. It really depends on which bridge so. you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. About 1930. Right, right Memorial Bridge. Right Memorial oh, Bridge. 1930. Yeah. And uh, so, that's about it. I grew up at Duck, and I enjoyed it. Still like Duck. Not there, but still a good place to be. And I uh, stayed there till I finished school at Kitty Hawk. Graduated from Kitty Hawk High School in 1941. And not long after that, 42, I joined the Navy, and from then on it was move on for several years. And I think we moved back to Duck in 19 and 50 something and we've been back there at, since then 
mostly. Well, uh, you know, when I first uh, got to know you, you were working as postmaster. And Nags postmaster? Head, uh, Nags Head. Nags Head. Well, that was a lot of years later. Right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Let me tell you one thing about Eddie. Um, he uh, was the first man in Dare County to begin shedding crabs in onshore shedders. The, somebody had experimented with that someplace else, and they'd, I think the, uh, uh, some people in Raleigh had done some research on it, and you picked it up. I, I really think it was up on Roanoke Island, and I, uh, let's see, I know there's people's name too, but uh, it was up on a bluff there, right up on the northeast mm -hmm. corner of Roanoke mm -hmm. Island. And these people had the first shedder on shore that I know of. Well, I take that back. I've always given you credit for that. No, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't have the first one, but, but I followed I it down the causeway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they showed me how. Well, speaking Before of that, crabs, I was shedding them overboard. Yeah, my only involvement with crabbing was when I was at Skyco. I should have told you this. There was a wonderful man there who was caretaker for Skyco Lodge. His name was Marshall Collins. Uh -huh. And uh, Marshall, in the four years I was there, I think I learned more from Marshall than anybody I've ever known except my own father. He was a, a wonderful man. And he used to take me out crabbing. Uh, he had a, a sail skiff and, uh, and a trot line. Uh, every three feet or so, I guess it was, probably they, he'd tie on a piece of bull nose, which was the bait. And he'd coil this whole thing up in the bottom of the skiff, and he would, uh, he would drop over a, a, an anchor and a buoy, and then we'd sail down, and then he'd drop another one. We'd come back, and he'd put that over his roller, and, we, and I just had to steer the, steer the skiff. And uh, it was exciting as a Dickens, and he he was he was so expert at flipping those crabs just before they fell off as they came up out of the water. He'd flip them back and back and back, and uh, it was one of my uh, one of my experiences at, at, at Skyco that I, I really especially enjoyed. Uh, he was a wonderful man, Stanley. And they, fortunately, they now call the the road going into the to the county buildings, the Marshall Collins Road, and that's sure justified. They used to do it that way up at uh, on trot lines, mm -hmm. and most of they used beef tripe for bait, mm -hmm. salted, and uh, a few times I went out and dipped crabs off the line, but uh, I was a little fella back then and <laughs> didn't do it too often. I guess maybe tripe was what they were using then because yeah, they came to bullnose later. Mm -hmm. It was yeah. the stomach of, ca of uh, cattle, yeah. steers, and yeah. it salted, mm -hmm. cured, and that way it stayed on a long time. Yeah. You could cut it up in strips and tie it on the line with a slip knot, and uh, you kept pulling the line back into a barrel of salt water mm -hmm. when you take it up every night so it wouldn't spoil. Mm -hmm and uh, run it back out the next I day. Didn't, I didn't and remember that. It would just yeah. last on and on, that beef. Yeah. That was so tough, yeah. the stomach of that beef, that it just stayed on there. <laughs> ever try eating it? Huh? <laughs> Did you ever try eating it? No. <laughs> I know people. I understand people, people do eat Yeah, I tried it once. No, I don't yeah. think I would My eat it. My dad that. tried I it. I eat the crabs, but some. not the tripe. <laughs> I didn't order a second helping. And I ate it once. You but, did. You did. Well, back up in the in, in uh, civilization, up in New Rochelle, New York, and I went to that friends. Was civilization. <laughs> I've been in New Rochelle. <laughs> well, I left it, but uh, anyway, I was visiting friends, and they were always trying different things, and they had tripe soup, and I thought tripe was fish, <laughs> and they didn't tell me what it was until after I'd eaten the whole thing. <laughs> no, uh, never again. <laughs> Well, you know, ever we're talking about fishing, and um, I know that there are a lot of different types of fishing that you've done. Just run down, run down the list of the different a types. Of different types of fish. Mm -hmm. Fishing. Fishing. Yeah, right. What are dif different methods of fishing that you've you've done during your life? You mean the type of fish? Well, after the fish, or just the method, whether it's 
hook and line net. Okay, all net fishing. They did it, several different types of nets, all net set nets, and uh, they fished out of duck out in the sign all over Great Duck Sign that way, and they also had haul nets. They run them out and sweep them around and move the fish down to the last end, bail them out, and things like that. I had fake nets that they set out from the shore. Fish would run the lead out and get into a trap at the end, which is very similar to pound nets that they use now. The pound net is a larger net, larger pound on it, hold more fish. So it, I grew up with that. A lot of them fished little haul seines, long nets, set nets that you set in the evening, go pick fish down them in the morning, take them up. Right. Then All turtles, turtles were trapped too. Turtles right. were trapped too. Didn't trap fish, no, not really. Turtles, though. Uh, you had turtles, traps for turtles. Oh, yeah, we caught. set turtle traps uh -huh, all over. They were made out of net, about two and a half feet in diameter with hoops in it. Out about of grapevine. Five or six feet. Yeah, grapevines were the hoops. And uh, they were about two and a half feet in diameter about six feet long, put a stake on each end, stake them down, and the turtle could swim in and he would fall between the lines. The bait was in the center. And, and then he'd try to get the bait, of course, and more would come in with him. And they worked. <laughs> <laughs> ever, did you ever catch any terrapin? Yeah, same way. Because they were a real delicacy, I understand, yeah. in New we York. We used those. And one of the... Uh, prime sources for terrapin shipped to New York was uh, uh, Pamlico Sound, Roanoke Sound, just back of Body Island. Yeah, uh, they, Diamondback terrapins, I believe they wanted yeah, up there. We used to eat those out of a uh, cypress swamp there in Kitty Hawk. Mm -hmm. One out uh, Kitty Hawk Woods out next to the beach there mm -hmm. in Southern Shores. Yeah. Deep water in there, and you used yeah. to go down there and catch them in turtle traps. They were big, big tar freshwater terrapins. Yeah. But uh, we ate those at duck. They were good, very good. And he, and you know, we're not talking about we're not talking about hunting. But I was uh, just thinking shorebirds. A lot of a lot of the species that were yep. on the beach then were hunted for food. Uh, we didn't have beef and pork and stuff around, or didn't even have freezers anywhere that I know of. <laughs> right. And uh, so you got whatever you could kill. Right. Um, and, uh, fall ground fall migrations of cedar wax wings. A lot, a lot of fowl. Right wildfowl and somebody would we had people who ran herds of cattle on the beach at open range the beach was all open range and once every once in a while someone would come along that is had uh, butchered a steer or something right. selling beef right and uh, they had to do it get out and sell it the same day i guess <laughs> so that's you didn't get beef very often right once or twice a year maybe right well i've heard uh, david talk about a dipping vat mm-hmm that uh, he grew up around. You ever run cattle through a dipping vat? Oh, what's that? You ever run cattle through a dipping vat? Uh, we had one there, Duck, and I did see it done there a time or two, but uh, they would run them, yeah, it was a cement vat maybe almost as long as this stage, and they would run them down a chute on one end and on through and they climbed out the other end, and it was filled with stuff that would kill the ticks on them. Right, and a lot of other things, too. Yeah. <laughs> sort of clean them up. Right. And that was probably at the end of the summer, or right. sometime during the summer they did that, to keep them from getting diseases. Right. Well, Marjolaine, do you... <laughs> <laughs> Am I last because I'm the oldest? You no, know, you're not last. <laughs> you aren't you're the not oldest last. by a long shot. <laughs> I, just, I just don't want to leave you out. Oh, good. <laughs> um, and, you know, I'm thinking, um, you know, with... Everett's uh, growing up on the sounds, and um, you know I can, I can appreciate the things that he's he's saying. I've um, you know have seen some of these things and heard some of these stories, so I I have that in my mind. I'm not since I don't know you as well, and and don't know whether you grew up in town. I knew you grew up, grew up here on Roanoke Island. Yes, but, I did, and my middle name is Midget, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> And to kind of, and so all these guys won't upstage me here. Um, there was an article, we had a public relations um, director here, 
And he must have heard Edward Green's story because he, uh, his article came out and the, the byline was, the only production or show with more midgets than the lost colony was the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> <laughs> And um, I, I think he must have heard, gotten that story from Edward. Um, it was wonderful growing up in, in Matteo and on Roanoke Island. I was born in the town of Matteo. I was born in my grandmother Willis's house, which is across from the White Doe, and it now belongs to the Winsteads, my very good friends, the Winsteads. Um, my uh, it was during the Depression, and um, families looked after families. It was quite necessary at that period of time. And I will tell you the date. It was, I was born May the 11th, 1927. Don't start counting up. <laughs> uh, but um, um, right down the street, my other grandmother, Nanny Cudworth Midget uh, uh, lived actually where Betty Blanchard and Butch's house is now. And uh, she had a, a larger house than my, my grandmother, who was a tillet from, from Juan Cheese. And um, so, uh, but I have to tell you a little bit about, about when, when I grew up with my grandmother. I uh, lived in my grandmother uh, Tillett Willis's house. Um, so I'm related to all the Tillets and the, the uh, Midgets and the Daniels and the Cudworths. And I've told lots of people that come to, to uh, Roanoke Island and Matteo for the first time that if they can't say something nice about the people on this island, they better not say anything because I'm related to all of them. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it was wonderful period of time, in spite of the depression, uh, to to grow up in this community. It was a very caring community, and um, I uh, never went hungry a day in my life. My grandmother, like everybody else, had uh, uh, chickens, and uh, she uh, had a garden. And uh, breakfast is like you would not believe. Everybody made, made uh, hot biscuits for breakfast. And you had the eggs from the chickens. And uh, I would go out with my grandmother to help collect the, the eggs. And she had one rooster that didn't like me a bit. He <laughs> just would chase me all over the, the, the yard. And to this day, I love birds to death, but I don't want them on me because of their feet. I, I think I have a, a syn syndrome here. <laughs> she, would, she would, when the, the, the chicks uh, would hatch from the eggs and when they would set, we'd bring the chicks in. And any of you that are as old as I am, um, if there's anybody out there, <laughs> that she would always put them behind the coal stove in a box. Uh, to keep them warm until they got old enough and big enough to kind of take care of themselves. And um, so we, we had baby chicks behind the coal stove. Uh, we didn't have central heat, to say the least, and I certainly didn't know what air conditioning was. And uh, when I was first born, my, my very earliest days, we actually didn't have power. I can remember my grandmother's gorgeous lamps that I wish I had them all now. They were, they were just so beautiful. They were all over the, the house. And there was one that she kept right at the top of the steps. Um, since we didn't have um, um, heat, uh, we slept on big, big feather beds. And they were wonderful. You could just run and take a big jump and land in the middle of them, and you were cozy warm for, for the, the, the rest of the, the night. Uh, the next morning when you got up, it was a little cool in the winter to step out of that feather bed in the warm, warm bed. 
Um, my grandparents taught me an awful lot about growing up and about life, and they were, um, as, as I was telling someone the other day, I grew up when people knew that it took a village to raise a child or to rear a child. And that certainly happened here on, on Roanoke Island when I was growing up. Um, I, I learned so much from my, my grandmothers and my grandfather. Um, later, I lived with my grandmother, uh, Midget, who was a Cudworth uh, from Wanchese. And each of my grandparents had marvelous skills. My grandmother, Tillett Willis, made the quilts that I treasure today. Uh, she uh, taught me how to, told me more about flowers and gardening and the names of, of trees and flowers. And um, when we went on uh, Easter egg hunts, the, the people at the North End didn't mind you going on their property at all to hide your eggs in the sand dunes up on the North End. And the, the community really helped looked after, look, helped to look after all of us kids. Um, I, when I, my grandmother did beautiful handwork and my grandmother Willis did a mother made beautiful clothes and my grandmother was a seamstress for the Lost Colony uh, when it started in 1937. And, and, but my grandmother Midget did beautiful handwork and taught me how to embroider and how to pull threads and do all sorts of, of handwork. And uh, they were both Christian women and brought me up in Mount Olivet Methodist Church. And the community there certainly had an important, played an important part in my life. Um, and actually, everyone on the, the island in Matteo was very active in Miss Mabel Evans Jones's The Lost Colony. She had productions on the north end of this island as far back as I can remember, and my parents and grandparents were uh, always a part of it. I inherited the love of the Lost Colony. I inherited it from, from people that played a very important part in my life that were actually my mentors. Um, because remember, not only did I go through the Depression, but I went through uh, uh, World War II. Uh, we had some of the things that I remember most, with my grandmother covering the windows with some of those beautiful handmade quilts because we were known as uh, Torpedo Junction and the, the German subs were off the beach and uh, they didn't, we, we had blackouts. The whole island was completely back, blacked out, and of course they turned off the uh, Wright Memorial light uh, uh, because we did not want any of the German subs to 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 come ashore here. And uh, we also went through uh, rationing. <laughs> and when I tell these stories to some of the kids that I teach or I have taught, they, they start to think that maybe I came over with the lost colonies. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I have to be careful how much I tell them sometimes. But um, uh, it, it, even during that terrible period of time in my life, when... Um, and when the, the rest of the world was building soup kitchens and, and people were having to line up because they were hungry and whatever, we were building a theater. And uh, we had men of visions back in those days that, that really knew how to 
envision and to take care of, of each other and the people on this island. And um, um, I, I, grew, I grew up with a, the whole community as my mentors and the whole community giving me the values that, that I have today. And you were talking about going to school and I just happened to um, have a 1944 Manio School newspaper that my class happened to, um, uh, I think we had the first school newspaper. And some of the people that you know that are in the, the boxing team was Billy Baum and David Farrow and Walter Gray and LaSalle Tillett and H.A. Creef and La Roswell Sanderlin and the Willett Tillett and Valton Williams and Ru Russell Nixon and Bernard Parker and Bill Cox. We had, um, st when I started in the eighth grade, there were 57 of us, it says here. Uh, by the time the war came along and we had to close the Lost Colony, and I'll get back to the beginning of the Lost Colony in a minute, but when we had to close the, the, the Lost Colony, uh, and a lot of the boys, being very uh, patriotic or were drafted, uh, left, we ended up, I ended up in a graduating class of 18. We started as 53 and ended up as 18. Uh, we were a pretty smart bunch, however, because we were from this area, and we did not have preschool. We did not have kindergarten. Uh, I was the, we were the last class to graduate from 11 grades. And we did okay. And I can thank the community for that and I can thank all of the mentors that we had along the way that, that really helped us to grow uh, with the proper values and the, the care of looking after each other. And I, I told um, a Horace that I said, there is no way I can separate this community from my experiences with the Lost Colony because they go hand in hand. Um, the, the same, a lot of the same businesses that are advertised for supporting the young people in the schools in this are some of the same business that are, businesses that are supporting the, the, uh, and educating, the, the, uh, helping to educate the children in Dare County today. We had fewer problems than they have now. And so it takes a lot more to, to really help our kids today. If there's ever been a youngster that had an opportunity to have their cake and eat it too, and I was told you couldn't do that, but I did. I was able to, to um, grow up and uh, go to college and become a teacher. Uh, teaching kids was one of my greatest loves in the whole wide world. And uh, today, I, I, I taught school for 30 years. It was my vocation. But I had an opportunity to be in the Lost Colony for more years than that. And that was my avocation. And in it all, I was able to have a marvelous family and uh, a wonderful husband uh, who was a Yankee but came down here <laughs> and loved it better than he did up north too, guys. Uh, his name was Harry Thomas and he also taught school here in Matteo. There's some folks here from Elizabeth City. And I guess I spent almost as many years in Elizabeth City, uh, but I'll have to tell you how I got there. Uh, we were living in Burlington, North Carolina, and my son Hunt was born in Burlington. And when he was two years old, each summer we would leave Burlington and rent our apartment and come down to Matteo for the summer. 
And we finally decided, hey, you know, we need to get closer home. It, it's, we really missed being home. And um, so we applied for jobs in, in Elizabeth City. And we packed Hunt up and uh, took him to Elizabeth City when he was two years old. And uh, every summer, Harry and I would pick him up and bring him down to, to um, Matteo for, for the Lost Colony. And um, so both, and then Barbara was born in Elizabeth City, uh, my daughter Barbara Dare. Not a Virginia Dare. She was a Virginia Dare when she was a baby, but we. Uh, n she's named for Barbara Griffith, uh, who was her godmother, and of course, Dare for who else? Virginia Dare. <laughs> so, she, uh, the 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 colony always crept into everything that I did. Um, I never taught a class that I didn't bring them on a field trip. To, to Matteo, to Fort Raleigh, to Wright Memorial, to Coquina Beach. And we saved their pennies and I brought them down to see the Elizabeth II and we donated our pennies to the, to the project of building mm, of the, the Elizabeth II. Um, uh, you just never forget, once, you, once you've grown up here, it's just in your blood, folks. You can't. <laughs> that the um, way I actually got in the Lost Colony, and this is going to be just about as long as, long, probably longer than any of you guys. But I warned them. I told them once you get me started on the Lost Colony, I can't. I can't <laughs> tell it all in a very short period of time. Um, the uh, College of the um, Albemarle. Um, made me a living legend and placed me with all of these wonderful group of, of folks. And I must tell you, I was very humbled then, and I am now, too. Um, uh, uh, an honor that I, I treasure and uh, the friendships I made. And I took a, a PowerPoint presentation to C COA. My kids had done a marvelous uh, film uh, on my life when I was 75 and um, is that when it was yes, yes. <laughs> I have to stop and think dates dates but um, uh, I, I was able to use that and I wore a lost colony costume and uh, it kind of showed my my life growing up here and what it meant to me, and the the to get back to how I got into to the lost colony to begin with. One of the things I'm most proud of is that five generations of my family have been in Paul Green's version of the lost colony. My grandmother, who was a costumer and helped make the costumes for. Uh, 1937 through the WPA and uh, they did a lot of sewing in downtown Manteo um, uh, in a, what they call the sewing room and then by the time uh, the theater was was built by our wonderful uh, Skipper Bell and um, I was telling David I remember his dad and, and him building that wonderful village up there at, at Fort Raleigh at the same time we were building the, the theater. And how I, I wish that we're still on the Park Service property now. Um, but my, my, in 1930, I did go to see the show. I stayed up there an awful lot. I really wanted to be in that show badly that year. Um, but uh, they thought I was maybe a little too, too young. But in 1938, they needed three flower girls for uh, the entourage for Queen Elizabeth. And there, my grandmother was a costumer, 
and uh, she did looked after the the costumes with Irene Smart Reigns, and 1938 was Rini's first year, so I I can remember that and Rini and um, my grandmother finagled to get me in the show as a flower girl. And uh, Rini became one of my mentors, and of course, my family and the community certainly was a mentor to me. Uh, I can remember Rini and my grandmother standing me up on the cutting uh, table uh, that William Ivy Long was talking about the other night, and he, um, my grand, my uh, Rini said, now stand still. I squirmed a lot then. <laughs> I guess I squirm a lot still. But she said, stand still now. One of these days I'm going to be making you an Eleanor Dare costume. And you know what? Came she did. <laughs> um, I uh, had a wonderful time growing up with the show. Uh, Back in those days, it was really wonderful because uh, one of uh, Paul Green's dreams was using as many of the local people in the show as, as possible and give us an, an, an opportunity for the show to be, be ours. And, uh, and there were people there that helped us to grow to the point where we could grow with the show. Um, about that time, Mabel Evans Jones started her camp, which was wonderful for all the, the kids that came down from Elizabeth City and um, other places to uh, spend two weeks or more at Miss Mabel Evans' Seatone camp. And the property uh, is still up there, and we've renamed it Seaton. <laughs> and um, I'm very, very fortunate to have a house that sits up on the top of where one of Miss Mabel Evans Jones's log cabins that was a part of Seaton Camp uh, was was our Harry's and my first summer home. Uh, uh, but at that camp. She would send a, a truck through the town of Manteo to pick up all of us locals. And we would go to camp at 8.30 and uh, stay until 1 o'clock. And during that period of time, we had dance, both tap, ballet, jazz. We had tumbling. We had arts and crafts, we learned uh, copper tooling, we learned wood burning, we, she had horses, we learned ho how to ride horses, uh, we, she had a um, um, swimming area, we learned to swim, we learned to sail, we learned to row, uh, just about anything that she could do to teach and help a kid learn. Miss Mabel Evans Jones did that. Uh, she was a, a mentor not only for me, but for, for all of us. And as uh, uh, David came up and visited me one day, and we just had a great time uh, talking about Miss Mabel. And uh, I'm very glad you explained how we had such a wonderful time. <laughs> <laughs> See what I mean? See what? I promise you, his his pants didn't fall off. <laughs> <laughs> and no boy. <laughs> but but um, we uh, went over and visited Miss Miss Mabel's um, restored. Camp Seatone, the large house, and Marietta Trainer lives in the house that Miss Mabel Evans Jones uh, actually designed, raised the roof, built, bricked, and and built for for her. Um, so I learned an awful lot of, about the arts at Miss Mabel's camp growing up. 
I learned an awful lot about music from my cousin Holland Westcott, who in uh, Mantio's schools, they didn't have a music teacher, so she taught piano there, and she also had what was known as a, a rhythm band. And I had a lot of, uh, my family has sung and played and danced for as long as I can remember. And so um, we were, were able to uh, in, enjoy all the things that we learned from Miss Mabel and Camp Seaton in the Lost Colony. And then when I got to the Lost Colony, they had summer classes and they had the professional theater workshop. And you, you just, I just grew with the show. I just grew with the place where I was born. And I, I really am such a lucky, lucky, fortunate girl. I had, as my mentors, not only Mabel Evans Jones and Irene Smart Rains, but that first year, Samuel Selden. He was the first director and he also oh, helped. Oh, man. Uh, uh, you, you, you knew Sam. Oh, yeah. And, um, uh, I, I don't know of anyone that took more pictures of me than Acock Brown. <laughs> and, and if you've seen that marvelous exhibit that we have here now that uh, um, is uh, going on, don't miss it. Go, go th and, and actually see the, the history of the Lost Colony. You'll see an awful lot of Acock Brown photos. Uh, the directors wanted to see us grow and taught us. And Clifton Britton uh, followed Sam Selden, and he was certainly one of my, my mentors. And not just mine, I'm talking about the other kids. You'll see pictures of all the kids lining up wanting parts to be in the, the, the Lost Colony. And Carl, you would have loved it. We were all volunteers. <laughs> we didn't get paid. <laughs> uh, but everybody wanted to volunteer. Everybody wanted to be in the Lost Colony. And one of the things I'm so thrilled about with, with Carl this, this, this summer is that, that he, and, and not only, well, for many, many reasons, but, but Carl has wanted more people from the island and more people from the area to be in the show. And uh, uh, he, he has, he's a story in himself, uh, but the Lost Colony sort of grew on him just like it did all the rest of us. And, and he got the bug fast. And he, the things he's doing for the show now is, is we're, we're just so thankful and so so pleased that he's taken it under his wing because the show has had some rough times. And Carl has, has um, uh, found a way to, to make this show run forever. <laughs> and, uh, he, he needs to, and he will. He'll tell you all about all about that. But uh, one of the things, I think, is to get all of us together again uh, in, in what we're doing tonight, what we're doing uh, in the whole area, and putting the community together again to bring out the strong points of, of Dare County. And we just have so many that... Uh, and one is the, the, the people who, who grew up here. We still maintain that same caring, that same friendliness, that same... Uh, I've, I've never known the Lost Colony to, to not care about uh, its, its, its people that came to be in the show. Uh, when one year... Uh, they, of course, didn't have enough money to, to pay all of us, us locals. So 
I was paid in 25 of these commemorative coins, <laughs> and they only minted 25,000 of them in 1937. And I think they sold them for... Made some money. Two, not yeah. much, um, yeah. like a dollar, two dollars. But they paid us at the end of the season. They gave us 25 of them. And they, they're worth 50 cents. And it has Eleanor Dare and the baby on one side. There's a marvelous story about that. Uh, and Sir Walter Raleigh on the other side. And um, for a, a little gal growing up here on Roanoke Island that went through the Depression, 50 cents meant a great deal to me at that time. And I wanted to run right down to Farron's Drugstore and, and, and buy a Coke, I'm sure. <laughs> but uh, my mom was smart enough and that she put two away, and uh, I was not to spend them. But I spent the rest of them. <laughs> and now they uh, are about, they're worth of about $400, yeah. I think, on, uh, is that right, Carl? Yeah. I think, I, I, and some of you have some, I'm sure, stashed away at home because a lot of people from Elizabeth City came down for those early shows of Miss Mabel's and put them together in the movies and, and took a very important part uh, in the beginnings of the Lost Colony and in the early memorial association of, of the Lost Colony. But, but my, my story is that I cannot separate community from my story with the lost colony. Um, I just feel that I was, a lot, for a lot of people, it was being born at the wrong time. But for those of us here uh, in, in Dare County, it turned out to be a right time. And I'm just so thankful for all the leaders that we had at, when I was growing up that made that, that possible. Uh, I grew with the show, and someone that asked me, what in the world does that mean? Well, last year, and then I'm going to hush, I promise, <laughs> the Lost Colony actually uh, dedicated the season to me. And LaBomb Houston, our historian now, wrote a, a marvelous story about the Lost Colony's 65th production season, the 69th anniversary year, and the 419th celebration of the birth of Virginia Dare is dedicated to Marjolaine Thomas. And uh, she compared me uh, that I was, she, she named me the Lost Colony's Pygmalion. That the Lost Colony took me and molded me, and I had an opportunity to grow with the show. And in the scope of things, LaBomb says, there are those who show up and do the job, and there are those who listen, learn, and make the job an important part of the whole. For Marjolaine, the latter course was the only option. Inspired by her Henry Higginses and all of these people, I, I have to go through the rest of my list. Rennie Williamson at Mount Olivet Methodist Church, Catherine Meekins helped me develop musically. All the, 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 they gave me an opportunity to sing with the Westminster Choir Group that came down. I, after I got a voice, uh, I was a voice major at Greensboro College, I came down and auditioned. And, and the music director said, absolutely. And so I, I was, was the first non-Westminster graduate to ever sing in the Lost Colony Choir. Uh, so I had a lot of Henry Higgins's to help me along the way and allowed me to grow with the show. Um, 
The latter course was her only option. Inspired by her Henry Higginses and their dreams, she said to them she'd do it. By George, she did. We salute you for growing with the show, for taking it through the lean times, and for gently reminding us of the past as we approach the future together. You are our fair lady, and in honor of your remarkable accomplishments, this season is for you. And I thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mark. Horace, may, may I ask the audience a question? I can't see him, so I don't know how I can. Maybe I can see hands. You may, David. How many of you have ever heard of Mabel Evans Jones before tonight? Are there many? I can't see. Quite yes, there are. About, yeah. um, about half. Amazing lady and typical of the people who were born here and brought up here and who really amounted to something. Mabel Evans was the first Woman. female... Superintendent. Superintendent of schools, schools in the state of North Carolina. And she uh, put on a play, a movie actually. She, she, it was her idea. She basically wrote it and she starred in it. The first Lost Colony uh, play, it was a movie, uh, shown all over North Carolina by the State Department of Public Instruction. And uh, where they didn't have electricity uh, they hooked up uh, uh, Model T Forbes, Fords and uh, the generators so they could show this film, the first one that many North Carolinians saw as their first motion picture. But she was an amazing woman, and I'm glad that Marjolene mentioned her. I've, I'm writing a series of biographies of people I call outer bankers to be remembered. And working on hers was one of the most pleasant because she was an amazing woman. But there have been so many other people here who have amounted to so much, and you don't hear much about them. Well, How old was Miss Mabel when she passed? I, I didn't... I have it written down at home, but I don't. Uh... The thing that was so most incredible about her, she never stopped learning herself. No. In, in the early days when we opened up the gallery, she was losing her vision, mm -hmm. but she would come down. She decided to take up watercolors, and they were kind of primitive, mindful of uh, Grandma Moses. Right. And uh, uh, people treasure them, those who still have some of them. And she would study. Get, she had to get it right up to the canvas, practically, to see. And, but she kept right on trying. And then one of the last <coughs> jobs that she did in her very later years was she wanted to improve her writing. And she went to Chapel Hill for the summer and took mm -hmm. a course in writing and then self-published a book. Which I, I, She had to have been 90 when she did that. I, so, I, I, remember, I, I remember my introduction to Miss Mabel was about during that period when I visited her at her home and and I remember the buildings around that complex mm -hmm. that was Camp Seatone and yeah. when um, I walked into the kitchen she was standing there in front of a whistling tea kettle and it was just blowing full in her face she couldn't see it or hear it either <laughs> but um, she she never gave up she never uh, quit. I, may I make one more com comment? Certainly. Um, I was talking about how this it takes a community to um, to, to raise a child or rear a child or takes a village and uh, uh, the, 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 that's true with the church the, the church was involved with the early lost colony too I uh, see uh, uh, Tom White's father was uh, the host minister and every single Sunday we had a worship service yeah at the Lost Colony Theater. And they actually put up a, a canvas over the ministers, the canvas to, uh, to keep the sunshine off or the rain, whichever it happened to be. And the choir was, uh, we had a choir loft at that time. Uh, and so the choir was always sitting in the choir loft and we always wore our um, uh, choir robes. And, um, um, it, it was always a wonderful service, and uh, we had ministers from all different denominations and different faiths, and uh, because actually 
The Lost Colony not only uh, had the first English child born in America, but it was also the first Christian baptism in um, um, America. Uh, Mantia, Chief Mantia was baptized, um, and we know that's a fact, and we know that's true because of, of the, the writings of John White when he went back to, to England. Um, so the the church, the school, the community, all was involved the early years of, of the, the lost colony. It was a community in, endeavor. And um, uh, Tom's dad was always the, the host, and I think he uh, was house manager for a while. Am I right about that? And uh, for, for about 20 years, so he kept things going the way they should at the top of that hill. And uh, there, there were just so, he was definitely a mentor to all of us. Uh, to get back to maybe the funny side of that story, um, I'm glad that uh, uh, we didn't have to take off choir robes or the, the ministers didn't have to take off their um, ministerial uh, uh, robes because I hate to tell you we had so little under them it would have been embarrassing. <laughs> so so I know, uh, you know how they must have felt. Yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I thought you might. I, I, I thought you you might, but we didn't lose our choir robes, or we didn't lose. Um, um, but we were. So it it was it was community. It was uh, mentors at that period of time all over the place. Uh, it was a, a wonderful time to grow up here in Matteo, Dare County, and the Outer Banks. Well, you know, of all the history that we have here on the Outer Banks, it, it wouldn't happen without the, the people. And um, you know, I, I think about that daily where I work at the Elizabethan Gardens. And often as I stand there and look across Roanoke, uh, Roanoke Sound at that approach where those first English colonists came and met the Native Americans at that site. And I have to pause because there's a plane that's on the approach to runway 17 and you let it drone and you, you have to think, well, when you live in the land of beginnings, you just have to love airplane noise too. <laughs> there are a lot of things that have happened since that first contact and with uh, the world that we live in in today. And we, we haven't talked a lot about uh, the Outer Banks in recent years. Um, you know, the recent memory is um, a lot clearer and shared by many more of us than the years that, uh, that y'all have related tonight. But I, I do appreciate uh, the contribution that all of you have made to the way of life here on the Outer Banks of North Carolina and the examples that all of you have set through your friendship and um, the way that you've reached out to others in the community through your business associations and your personal relationships and just those who, who haven't known you but who have just been able to uh, perhaps observe you from a distance or benefit from the works that you have done. Um, we want to leave some time this evening for questions from the audience. I know that... Um, <laughs> I think Carl is ready. I didn't mean to upstate. That's, easy. That's okay, Carl. I know you're ever ready. Um, Carl has a microphone, is going to pass uh, the microphone for those of you who do uh, have questions of uh, anyone here. Anybody have a question? We just want to leave enough time for the answers. <laughs> Thanks, Carl. Um, this is probably directed at Marjolene. Do you remember Dr. Gates? And um, just even more generally for any of you, if you could talk about medical care um, kind of in the, the early, say, you know, 20s, 30s, 40s, and in particular, Marjolene, midwifery. One of the things at the History Center we've heard practically nothing about is women's health care and birthing in particular. I'm so glad you asked that. 
<laughs> my great grandmother, Charlotte Tillett, was a midwife, and um, I um, had her. My mom saved. She was as big a pack rat as we are at my house. Saved her book, her midwifery book, and I showed it. I think to Edward Green one time when he was when he was up there at my house. I still have it. Um, uh, she did a lot of birthing of the babies. Uh, then Mr. Dr. Gates came, but I was actually delivered by Dr. Johnson. And uh, most of my generation was delivered by Dr. Johnson. And um, um, when uh, my brother was, was born, my brother Sam Midget, uh, Junior, he and Cormay Bassnight's Dottie Fry. Uh, Cormay was pregnant at the same time, and they were both uh, expecting at the same time. And Doctor uh, Doctor Johnson really didn't know which house to go to first because he was needed in both of them just about at the same time. But it was um, um, uh, Doctor Johnson, and then. Uh, uh, he not only birthed the babies, but um, uh, I had an opportunity to go to to school with uh, his daughters, Laura uh, Johnson and Jean Johnson and Nancy. Uh, I didn't know Nancy as well. She's a little younger than than Laura and Jean, but. Um, it, it was a it was a a, a, a problem, um, even as late as when my twin nephews Sammy and, and Danny Midget were were born. Uh, uh, they went. She was to go. Her doctor was in Elizabeth City, a Dr. Hoggard, and uh, so she waited a little bit late. Uh, Betty Midget and. The, the, uh, my brother's wife and my dad and um, uh, my stepmom Mary Midget drove her to um, uh, to to Elizabeth City and one twin was born in Curry Tuck County going over the, <laughs> the <laughs> over the railroad track and the other one was born going into the, the hospital. And when she uh, pulled up at the hospital, uh, they had called and Dr. Hoggard came out of the, the hospital. And you can imagine, I don't know who was in the worst shape, my, my dad or Mary. And Dr. Hoggard stuck his, his head in, in the, the door and said, well, Miss Midget, what do you want, half my salary? And or half my bill, and she said, "No, I want it all." <laughs> and my dad, they drove to our house. We lived on Raleigh Street in Elizabeth City. Woke us up and came in. They were an absolute wreck, both of them. But it it, it was a problem, and I don't think we appreciate how fortunate and how lucky we are now to have the health care that we have available to us here in in Dare County. I've had plenty of reasons to experience that. Uh, everything that happened uh, uh, last year sounded like roses, but I did have um, uh, open heart surgery in um, last September. And my good doctor, uh, uh, White from Elizabeth City was my cardiologist and um, absolutely insisted that I have um, a heart catheterization. And I think I was in denial and I didn't want to go. I didn't want to do it. But he insisted that I have it done. And I had uh, congestive heart failure on the table. And day, then two days later, I had a new aortic valve. And I got the scar up here to show <laughs> show for it, but we are really, really, truly blessed to um, 
have the health care that we have available now. And it has grown, and it is. Um, we did go from midwives to Dr. Gates to, to uh, D Dr. Johnson to what we have now. And I'm glad you, you mentioned that. If, if you would like to, my, my book to go on display here of uh, midwifery in the 1800s, maybe I'll donate that. <laughs> Thank you, March. Other questions? May I address this business of medical care? Certainly. Um, we didn't have any on the beach for years and years. They always had a doctor, often two doctors on Roanoke Island. And, but on the beach, no. And we had to go to Elizabeth City or when Dr. Wright finally was up in Jarvisburg, mm -hmm. we'd go to him. But when I was a boy at Skyco, I had two experiences with two, two doctors. The first was Dr. Hoyle, whom you did not mention. Okay, now, you're right. Dr. Hoyle preceded Dr. Dr. Uh, Johnson. Dr. Jo uh, Hoyle had a problem, and he was hunchback and scared the dickens out of me and all the other kids. <laughs> uh, uh, the only thing I can remember, other than my personal experience with him, was when he appeared before with the boys in Manio High School to talk to us about sex. Never, never forget it. Never forget what he told me. <laughs> and and I don't think the other boys ever forgot it. It was very simple. Keep your keep your your pants buttoned. Is what he said. <laughs> and I'll never forget that. But um, and uh, up. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I just had to do that. Uh, <laughs> We had, uh, we had several horses down at Skyco, and uh, used to ride them a lot. And there was a fellow named Harold Bruce Lennon, anybody mm -hmm. know that name? Mm -hmm. uh, who used to come down, and we used to race sometimes. And we were racing around the field down there. And uh, unfortunately, it had rained a day or so before, and there were little puddles. And my horse slipped and fell, and I went sailing over the horse's head. The horse rolled over on top of me. And my and Carl, uh, Marshall Collins and my sister was sitting back watching this race and came running out and and uh, and said something about what look at his legs. It wasn't my legs. I said I went over head first and and what I said it was up here my head and I couldn't get my head because I broke my arm back here when I went over the horse's head. Yeah. So here I am with my arm like this, and they rushed me in to see Dr. Johnson. He wasn't there. Oh. So they went downtown and roused old Dr. Hoyle, who had a, still had his little office there beside his house. It was right in the, downtown, all the way down to, downtown in Manio. And he finally agreed to do what he could, and I'll never forget it. He got Marshall to hold on to this part of my arm while he pulled on the other never gave me a thing you know. and he finally got it so it looked pretty straight though later when they took x-rays it wasn't quite straight and had to be broken again but um, he didn't have any splints now he'd, he'd ceased practicing it was very nice of him to come out there and do this and so he finally went out in his, in his, in his uh, chicken yard and he got some 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 chicken wire and he folded it and he made two splints out of chicken wire and uh, um, sent me home and my folks were away they came back about three days later, later and my whole all my fingers here were cut from that chicken wire <laughs> and so that was my first experience my second one was with Dr. Johnson uh, somebody got a fool idea here that the young men should have a football game. I'm talking about the ones who passed school and, and most of us just sort of bumming around. And I think it initiated down at, uh, at uh, the tavern down on the road down here. And so uh, it was to be the city slickers and the, and the um, and the country bumpkins. The city okay. slickers were residents of Manio. The country bumpkins were Wanchies and the beach. <laughs> uh, 
we had uh, one practice at which they simply decided what position you play and, and gave us a uniform. I, I don't know where we got the uniform. It must have been <laughs> from high school. And so early in the game, I was, uh, I was a halfback, and I was given the ball, and I ran into the line, and somebody hit me, and I went back, and Corey Tillett, anybody know Corey Tillett sure. Sr.? Corey Tillett fell on my leg, and I broke my leg. <laughs> uh, and... Uh, Never did like Coy. <laughs> now his wife. I'm related to Coy. His wife. Well, his wife is lovely. <laughs> uh, I had the occasion to hug his wife today. <laughs> so I guess that makes up for it. <laughs> but in in any event, uh, uh, I had a car, obviously stick shift, and um, an old old Desota, Airflow Desota. They carried me off the field and put me in my car. Have you ever tried to drive a car with stick shift in one foot? <laughs> I don't know how in the world I did it, but somehow or other I came, the, the, the field incidentally was where the elementary school is now. And I drove from there and back by the Meth Baptist church to Dr. Johnson's house which had steps that went up. I think there were 108 <laughs> steps. It seemed to me it was that much. You know? And I, I hobbled up those steps on one foot, rang the doorbell, and the maid said that Dr. Johnson was eating Sunday dinner. And he'd be with me. So I sat there for about a half an hour. And he finally came out. And uh, he looked it over. And he said, well, well you've got to go to Elizabeth City to get an x-ray. So I hobbled back down, <laughs> got in my car. Some, I don't know how I ever got it turned around because I was heading in the other direction and headed back to the beach. And uh, I saw my folks, and the next day, Dad took me up there. Dr. Johnson didn't do very good by me that day. <laughs> so that's, those are my experiences. Thank you, David. Other questions? Shala has one here. I have two real quick questions. Mr. Tate, were you ever in the Lost Colony? Pardon? Were you ever in the Lost Colony? No. no he was no. in the Duck Lost Colony. He was, he was too <laughs> yeah. far up. That, that was, was lost a Lost Colony. <laughs> <laughs> you were yeah. the Lost Duck. Yeah. And I know that Edward was in the Lost Colony, and I know that he came here as a dancer. And I remember when I worked for him one time, he came in, and we said, show us your dance step. And Edward said, I'll gladly show you my dance step. So Let's please show us your dance step. <laughs> <laughs> but I've got to explain. Have you all seen the photograph over in the yeah. exhibit yes. Yes. with me in split, yeah. in a yeah. giant in split? Well, you know, I have, give me a chance. I have to warm up just okay. a little. <laughs> 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 Edward, it may be the last time you do anything. What do you think? <laughs> I'm, I'm, so, that funny this time. <laughs> I'm so glad we paid the liability insurance. <laughs> I do it quickly. Yes. Uh, I just want um, Everett to tell about the list that, I, uh, that you have there. Uh, you still have that list of all the, the juke joints. You know, I gave you that list that you told me about. <laughs> All the juke joints, is, it really is interesting to hear about. Juke um, joints? In the 30s and 40s, uh, from um, Wright Memorial Bridge to the Nags Head Casino. Ever so who told you, tell you about, about those juke joints? Huh? Well, I don't know anything about them. Somebody wrote this down <laughs> now. <laughs> <laughs> A tavern at the foot of the Wright Memorial Bridge owned by Myrtle and Jim Garrett. Filling station at Dirt Road going to Kitty Hawk. Log cabin owned by a Norwegian fellow. <laughs> <laughs> the corner at the bottom of Curve, there wasn't any bypass, so the road got down in Curve to Beach Road. 
And that was, do I, am I supposed to say who owned them? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> I can't remember names very well. Well, the corner at the bottom, that was Lindsay Dowdy's place. Place serving food, dance floor, and Kitty Hawk Coast Guard Station. I remember the joint there, but I don't remember the name of it. <laughs> Toller's Wigwam, south of Coast Guard Station, owned by Blaine Toller. I knew that. It was a big beer joint. <laughs> Lewis Tate's Juke Joint, south of Toller's Wigwam. Another one. <laughs> Filling Station, south of Lewis Tate's place. I guess that was another beer joint, too. <laughs> Hickey Swain's place, a house with no marking, no sign, had a dance floor, jukebox in front. You could buy bootleg whiskey there. Hickey would go out the back door and hand you a bottle in a sack. <laughs> <laughs> ABC store was next to him. <laughs> Kelly Parker had grocery store and beer. Nags had casino owned by Ras Westcott. That was a real hangout. <laughs> That's all the places I have here. Related to him, too. Did you go to all those? Oh, yes, I did. Yeah, yeah, uh, I've been in all of them. Uh, that's, what, that's what I thought. <laughs> It isn't that he forgot them. He didn't want to admit to it. <laughs> Oh, well, there was no other recreation I know of. <laughs> the casino didn't have bowling alleys back oh, then. Oh, there were some. They were so. young then. Huh? <laughs> didn't even have the casino, I don't think, then. Uh, another question for Everett. Uh, I understand that the Duck and the beaches north of that used to be a bombing range for the Navy. What did you do when you lived up there? Duck. Well... <laughs> <laughs> hey, Duck. Duck. <laughs> You ducked every once in a while, but <laughs> that was just north of where we lived, about a half mile. And it was really what they did, they came across, they would go around, circle over Craytuck and come in on a run with uh, rockets under the wings of the torpedo planes or whatever planes and, and uh, hit the targets. So that was a lot of noise. But uh, I wasn't there most of that time. I was gone. But my folks lived right at the north end of the woods, so they got the full benefit of those. <laughs> Everett, the duck person who lived closest to that bombing range was Tommy Tate. Yeah, he was closer. And Tommy Tate is a very famous person because he was the first one who flew in... In a glider, what? <laughs> on, a, on a glider, on one of the Wright Brothers' gliders. That's his, right. He his was the first father, one. Danny Tate, was the only employee of the Wright Brothers. And so Tommy Tate... Uh, was the one who was hanging around the Wright brothers all the time, and they experimented with him before they put an adult on one of well, their... Well, he weighed about half what any of them would weigh, if even that. He was very small yeah. then. And uh, so they tried him out first. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and he uh, made it. <laughs> but he was a real character. I can remember driving up that way in cold weather and he never had a shirt on he no i know 20 12 hours and 12 soon as the sun came out he pulled his shirt off that's right yeah uh, ever yeah. uh, tell uh, tell about how tommy used to uh, brag about how he f was the first one to fly and uh, you fellas didn't believe it how he did what uh you remember how you said that he used to tommy used to uncle tommy used to brag about how he was the first to fly Oh, Could yeah. you tell him about that? Well, he, well, we used to be out partying, and he'd say he was the first one that ever flew in that darn thing. And he was. We, we thought he was lying. No, he wasn't glider. In the, <laughs> in fact, we're almost a kite. But he was the first one that flew in that glider. Yeah. The, the, right, the, the guys put him in it. And, and not a kill double hill, but west of it, West Hill, the hill they used but an it, awful lot for the But he train. was a very small fellow. Yeah. So... Uh, I guess they wanted to see if he, he would, he'd he would, do all right for one of them, got it. <laughs> how did you get around Duck when you were a kid? I, I, the reason I asked that we is had that... A, the, we had a dirt road went out through Kitty Hawk Woods to the... A dirt home. road. It yeah. was sand. Sand road. You, you guys yeah. used to do a lot of running, yeah. didn't you? I rode school bus out that to Kitty Hawk School every mm -hmm. day and back for years. I've seen pictures of that school bus. It was quite something. Huh? Didn't the school bus have some 
drapes on the side that you let down in the cold weather? Well, that was the first one we had. They didn't have any windows in it. So they just put a curtain down each side. And that was, I don't know, I think it was a Model A Ford. Mm -hmm. Model A engine in that. And uh, Charlie Cowell, who taught sixth and seventh grade, and Miss Nellie Cowell, his wife, who taught third and no second and third grade known as dr caldwell as doctor though he charlie wasn't doctor. caldwell was his yeah. name and yeah. uh, and uh they they stayed they uh boarded up there at uh a lady's house there in duck mm -hmm. and drove the school bus from kitty hawk up to duck and back back and forth yeah and uh that's how we first started the school i started school there in the first grade right in that school bus when did you learn to drive and where? Me? Gosh, I don't know. Well, I, l I learned to drive on the flats down at New Inlet. Uh, my dad would go down to Hatteras Island quite often, and I'd go along with him as a, between 9 and, and 13, but I think maybe when I was 10 or 11. And uh, there was this area where an inlet had been open and then closed and it left a huge flat area and uh, dad just turned me loose i couldn't run into anything i couldn't <laughs> hurt anybody and, and uh, but you, david you did run across or come on to a truck that had been turned upside down on the beach one day well uh okay uh, i'll tell you about that too uh, riding through the buxton woods one time and all of a sudden there's a car turned over on the side of the road, and I thought, oh, my little kid scared to death. I wonder if anybody's been killed. Uh-uh. No, the guy's axle was broken, and the best way to, to fix it was to turn the damn car over. <laughs> 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 but, uh, but I, I can remember when the summer we were staying at Virginia Dare Shores, um, Driving in the sand, I think you people should probably don't understand this. You had two tracks. What happened if you met somebody coming in the same tracks? You turn, you pulled out and got your left wheel in the right track. The other guy did the same thing and just passed by and then oh got back in the two tracks. <clears throat> um, we used to, in order to drive from uh, Virginia Dare Shores to Nags Head, we had to go through the Nags Head Woods which was opposite Collington. Now, I lived on Collington for years. I love Collington, I love Collatonians, but I think I better tell you this story. Uh, there was a man who was driving down there in the 20s, and uh, his car broke down. I think he had a flat tire. So he walked all the way back to Kitty Hawk to get a tire. Uh, they didn't have a tire. So they ordered him a tire. So two days later, he has the tire. He goes down there. The car is jacked up. All the tires are gone. <laughs> 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 and, and the wheels, too. <laughs> so they ordered, they ordered a whole set of tires and wheels. When they came in, went down again, the engine was gone. <laughs> And I can remember, I can remember seeing that hook there for years. It was right there opposite Collington. And I've always kidded my, is there anybody here from Collington? I hope not. <laughs> I always kidded my Collington friends. Somebody, oh boy. Uh, and I'm always kidded my Collington friends about uh, that car. And the, the, the claim was the Collington Tonians had done it. I don't think they probably would have. Somebody from Nags said Woods. <laughs> Do we have any more questions? This is for Edward. Edward, how many years did you actually perform in the Lost Colony, and what inspired you to open the Christmas shop? Actually, I only did two years in the Lost Colony, uh, 53 and 54. And in 55, I got into the union, and being that the colony, it, it was, with the colony, it's always about money. It's seriously, it's an incredible organization, and even in the early days, the, uh, the state legislature, I remember hearing that in 1953, uh, advanced it $10,000 to, 
to try and get it started up again that year. And I think we were paid $35 a week. Uh, but it was a joy to be part of, and, and so it, get, it, it has a life of its own, and here it is today. It costs so much more to produce the show, so it's still about raising and getting money to keep it going. Uh, but when I, in 55, I got in the union, could not come back to do it. And I wanted so much, because my heart belonged to Carolina. And uh, so whenever I could take a vacation, the only place I ever went was back down here. And fortunately, one summer, I decided I'd had theater for a while, and it was too late for me to get in the colony, so I uh, just came down and spent the summer here in 62. That was right after the Ash Wednesday storm. Right, I mean, that's right, yeah. And uh, the beach was rather quiet that summer, and I came down in the spring, and I decided, why not come back for the summer? So I got a lot of friends of mine who were artists to uh, give me work, and I came down and rented the house where the Christmas shop eventually ended up being, but uh, I was living like a hippie that summer. I put the artwork out in the yard. I wanted to test to see if maybe I could start a gallery. And uh, then at night, when it got dark, I didn't have any lights. I mean, there were just bare bulbs in the house, and so I'd close up and hang out backstage with a colony. And then I decided, well, I'm going to come back. It took me five years to figure out how to scrape enough money together to make an offer to Melly Pierce on the property. And talk about Southern hospitality. Melly bought my dream. And if she hadn't given me a deal on that property, I probably wouldn't be here today. So uh, what had happened was, if, you, if people know about show business, you don't always work. I remember in, in one summer, uh, the uh, union uh, monthly newspaper was so proud, it was boasting that uh, in, for live theater doing Broadway shows, we had more workers in the union than ever working that year. And it was something like 4,000 doing shows, summer stock and touring and Broadway shows. The union was about membership of about 16,000, so there was a message there. <laughs> and so I, I, when you're not working, you have to stay. If you want to be present, you have to find other work to do. And uh, up at Equity, there was a an, an, uh, bulletin board that accepted offers of other kinds of work. And it, it said, somebody with creative flair, we're looking for to uh, do Christmas tree displays. And I went down and found out that I could do that for them. And I went out into the field and helped uh, decorate Christmas uh, department stores and shops and shopping centers. And then I got a show and went right back to show business again. But when I finally decided that it was time for me to get out of New York and start a new life in North Carolina, I thought I'm not going to, I don't fish, I don't hunt. <laughs> um, there was not much for me to do, so I'd better invent something. And uh, I'd heard about people selling Christmas decorations year-round. So I decided to do that and try an art gallery, which I had tried five years earlier. And so we started out very modestly in the original building, which was 1,200 square feet, and the rest is history. Uh, ultimately, when we closed it, it was 30,000 square feet. And I'm... Uh, but being here and getting the support of the community, they welcomed me back, and the rest is history. Those two have talked about their careers and, and getting started in Dare County, Marjorie and Eddie. May I say something about mine? You may, but which one? <laughs> <laughs> this is early on, but um, I, I went to Elizabeth City. Uh, my dad moved to Elizabeth City when I was a sophomore in high school, and. Uh, my senior year, I was the editor of the school paper, and uh, I take it back, my, uh, my junior year, I was editor of the sc school paper, and that summer, uh, down at Nags Head, we rented a cottage, and Dad and W.O. Saunders, the editor-publisher of the Elizabeth City Independent, were good friends, and somehow I ended up doing a column called Nags Head News and Notes for the weekly column for the Elizabeth City Independent. I was 15 at the time. <clears throat> and in one of those columns, I used the word heck. 
W.O. Saunders changed that to hell, uh -oh. which is what I got from the adults. <laughs> I'll tell you that. <laughs> uh, the next year, I was hired by the, by the Daily Advance in Elizabeth City as the Dare County Bureau Manager. My most memorable occasion in the newspaper business was the day that I, somebody told me that a plane had crashed at Na on the sound side at Nags Head. The story was that a fellow had flown down and landed on the flats there just uh, north of uh, sound side Nags Head. He'd gone down to the Nags Head Beach Club that night. They had a big dance, as they always did, some drinking, I assume. And so he and, and somebody else there became good friends, and he offered to take the other fellow up in his plane as soon as it was daylight, which he did. And so the two of them went up in the plane and ended up coming straight down and, and head first, at the, right at the sound side, in between a couple of cottages. This was big news. Uh, I, in addition to being the bureau manager for the Daily Advance, I was also the string correspondent for the Associated Press. That job I had through Alf Drinkwater, who was a wireless oper telegraph operator here. So the first thing I did was to find a telephone, and I called Alf Drinkwater, and I said, uh, send a, a, a one-liner off to Associated Press. Two men killed in an airplane crash at Nags Head, North Carolina. Then I went back with my camera, took a bunch of pictures, interviewed everybody I could find, wrote half a dozen stories. Uh, the following Monday, this was a Sunday morning, the following um, Monday afternoon, my pictures and, and, and articles spread all over the front page of the Daily Advance, and I was one proud son of a gun. Mm. Until a month or so later, and I received from Associated Press the little one-page newsletter that they sent out to stringers all over the United States, thousands and thousands of string correspondents. The lead story, how not to cover an airplane crash. <laughs> I'd forgotten about Associated Press and never sent them anything else. <laughs> so that was the beginning of my career. <laughs> Thank you, David. <laughs> How'd you get that in? People, somebody making fun of me about dropping my pants. So <laughs> <laughs> I had to get something in worthwhile. <laughs> well, it's difficult. We knew tonight it was going to be difficult for us um, to get a leg up on you. <laughs> oh, Are there boy. any more questions? <laughs> <laughs> that tops it. <laughs> Are there oh, any more it's... questions from the oh, floor? It's... Yes. Yes, Linda, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was 17 years old when I came to Dare County, fresh out of high school. My mother was living in the house that Mellie Pierce owned that eventually became Edwards Art Gallery. She was there during Hurricane Donald. To give you a little idea of how high the water was in that area, she woke up about five or six o'clock in the morning when her hand fell off a uh, bed that you had to have a step on in the water. The car was almost completely covered. Now, the first time that I met Edward, or Eddie, he was outside Melly's house selling his artwork. And I know you don't remember this, but we were talking about things that you wanted to do. And he did say, I want to open a Christmas shop. And he had talked to Linwood Cutrell. Some of you remember Linwood. Oh, yeah. And a lot of people thought Edward was crazy. <laughs> and as he said not too long after that, was I crazy? I've laughed all the way to the bank. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> My life has been made so much richer by that very first conversation with you. You are a dear friend, and I love you and treasure you. My first meeting with David Stick, 
I went to work with Dare County when I was 17. Was they I were, wearing shorts or trousers? <laughs> <laughs> he had on not quite a suit, but yes, his pants were on and they were up. <laughs> <laughs> he had a bookstore. My first job oh, in yeah. Dare County was with then the welfare department. Then I went with the Board of Education. David was so good to Dare County in the 60s as he always has been. We would not have had the books in the Dare County school system. And there were then only about 1,500 or less kids within the whole system. The high school I graduated from had almost as many kids as we had in the county. David helped us order books. He didn't charge us what he should have charged us. And the one thing he taught me was be the best that you can be. If you don't always get it perfect, keep trying. Eventually you'll be like him. <laughs> 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 But I truly have very fond memories of spending many hours at the bookstore with he and Phyllis. Marjolene, the first time I saw her, I was somewhere that I wasn't supposed to be. <laughs> but there were not that many ABC officers around at the Shrine Club. <laughs> but Hunt would be sitting sometimes over in the corner and such wonderful memories of the floor shows from the Lost Colony. And Marjolene, the lullaby will always be in my heart, mind, and soul, Marjolene's lullaby. But you ought to hear her sing Summertime. <laughs> <laughs> and Everett, the first time I met he and Susie, he was postmaster at Nags Head. But they had a little business on the side. And where's Mark? Mark and Frank had a job on the side. Every Friday, we would go, my husband Arvin and I, and he ran a charter boat, we would go and give Mark and Frank a big nickel. That was 50 cents for all the eels they could catch. Well, one night we were on our way to Dune Burger, or That's a Burger was what it was called then, and we stopped and got eels. Mark was the one that closed the bag up with the sand, and I don't know, probably 20 or 25 eels. Those eels got loose in the car. <laughs> I was barefooted and I felt something slimy oh, around my God. feet and I don't care what Susie or Everett or Mark or Frank would say, an eel is a snake. <laughs> well, from that story with the eel.